Hello everyone. Today, Tapbook is honored to introduce to you the book, The Day the Floods Came, by author M. C. Beaton. The Day the Floods Came is a gripping mystery story set in a small town by a river in England. When a flood hits, dark secrets from the past begin to be revealed. This book has all the elements you love in a detective story. Compelling characters, a gripping plot, and unexpected twists and turns. So what are you waiting for? Let's explore The Day the Floods Came with Tap Book. Stay tuned to Tap Book for more introductions to great and meaningful books. Chapter One It was one of those gray days where misty rain blurs the windscreen and the bare branches of the winter trees mournfully drip water into puddles on the road as if weeping for summer past. Agatha Raisin turned on the switch to demist the windscreen of her car. She felt that inside her was a black hole to complement the dreariness of the day. She was heading for the travel agent in Evesham, one thought drumming in her head, Get away! Get away! Get away! For miserable Agatha felt rejected by the world. She'd lost her husband, not to another woman, but to God. James Lacey was training to take holy orders at a monastery in France. Sir Charles Fraith, always her friend and supporter when James went missing, had just got married in Paris and without even inviting Agatha to the wedding. She'd learned about it by reading a small item in Hello magazine. And there had been a photograph of Charles with his new bride, a French woman called Anne-Marie Duchesne, small, petite, young. Grimly, middle-aged Agatha sped down Fish Hill in the direction of Evesham. She would escape from it all. Winter, the Cotswolds, where she lived in the village of Parsley, a broken heart and a feeling of rejection. Although, she reflected, hearts did not break. It was one's insides that got twisted up with pain. Sue Quinn, the owner of Go Places, looked up as Agatha Raisin walked in and wondered what had happened to her usually brisk and confident customer. Agatha's hair was showing grey at the roots, her bear-like eyes were sad, and her mouth was turned down at the corners. Agatha sank down into a chair opposite Sue. I want to get away, she said, looking vaguely round at the posters on the wall, the brightly coloured ranks of travel brochures, and then back at the world map behind Sue's head. Well, let's see, said Sue. Somewhere sunny? Maybe. I don't know. An island. Somewhere remote. You upset about something? asked Sue. In her long experience, unhappy people often headed for islands. Unhappy people or drunks. Islands drew them like a magnet. No, snapped Agatha. So deep was her misery, she did not want to confide in anyone, and in a sick way she felt her misery still somehow tied her to James Lacey. All right, said Sue. Let me see. You look as if you could do with a bit of sun. I know. What about Robinson Crusoe Island? Where's that? I don't want one of those club med places. It's in the Juan Fernandez archipelago. Sue swung her chair and pointed to the map. Just off the coast of Chile. It's where Alexander Selkirk was marooned. Who's he? He was a Scottish seaman who was marooned there, and Daniel Defoe learned about him and wrote Robinson Crusoe based on his adventures. Agatha scowled in thought. She had read Robinson Crusoe in school. She couldn't remember much about it except it conjured up a vision of remoteness, of coral beaches and palm trees. She would walk along the beach and feel the sun on her head, and get her life together. She gave a weary shrug. Sounds okay. Fix it up. Three weeks later, Agatha stood in the hot sunshine at Tobalava Airport in Santiago and stared at the small Lassa Airlines plane which was to carry her to Robinson Crusoe. There were only two other passengers, a thin bearded man and a young pretty girl. The pilot appeared and told them to climb on board. The girl sat in the co-pilot seat, and Agatha and the bearded man on one side of the plane. The other side was laden with a cargo of toilet rolls and bread rolls. Agatha's luggage, as per instructions, was limited to one travel bag. 
But the temperature in Santiago had been 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so she'd only packed underwear and light clothes. Her lunch was in a paper bag, one can of Coke, one sandwich, and a packet of potato chips. The plane took off. Agatha gazed down at the vast sprawl of Chile's capital city and then at the arid peaks of the Andes. Then, as they headed out over the Pacific, her eyelids began to droop and she fell asleep. She awoke an hour later. She knew it was no use trying to talk to her fellow passengers because she didn't speak Spanish and they didn't speak English. There was nothing to see but miles and miles of ocean. She shifted miserably in her seat and wished she'd brought a book to read. The pilot had a newspaper spread over the controls. She hoped he knew where he was going. And then, suddenly, after another two hours of flying over the seemingly endless ocean, and just when Agatha was beginning to think they would never arrive, there was Robinson Crusoe Island. Boo! It seemed to rear up out of the sea in front of them, black and jagged as if the Pacific had just thrown it up. The small plane chugged towards the cliff, closer and closer. What's happening? thought Agatha, as the plane appeared to start heaving its way up the cliff face. He's not going to make it. But with a sudden roar, the plane lifted up and over the cliff top and came to land on an airfield. No airport buildings, no control tower, just a flat cliff top of dusty red earth. It turned out the pilot had some English. Agatha gathered they were to walk down to a boat and the luggage and cargo would be taken down separately. She could feel goose flesh rising on her arms. It was cool, though sunny, like a good Scottish summer's day in the Highlands. Agatha did not grasp she had moved into a subtropical zone. She only knew that she should have packed a sweater. The pretty girl, who had been one of her fellow passengers, indicated the road they were to take, and with the bearded man they walked across the airfield of dry red earth, where locusts flitted in front of them like so many pieces of blown tissue paper. The road curved down and down. The jeep with the cargo and luggage roared past them. Bastards, muttered Agatha, who was a strictly five-star hotel traveller. They might have given us a lift. Just when her legs were beginning to ache with all the walking, she saw the sea below, a cove and a launch bobbing at anchor. Seals floated on their backs in the green and blue water. Hundreds of seals. There were already people waiting on the jetty, all young men carrying backpacks. Agatha, when she was miserable, liked to be fussed over and cosseted. When the luggage was stowed and they climbed on board and were given life jackets and told to sit on the hatches, Agatha suddenly wished she'd stayed at home. You English? asked a tall hiker type. Yes, said Agatha, grateful to be able to speak after such an enforced silence. How long until we get there? About an hour and a half. You could have gone by road, but it's pretty rough. Everything seems pretty rough, remarked Agatha. Above her, black mountains and sheer cliffs soared up to the blue sky. No beaches, nothing but barren rock. A great setting for a horror movie or a movie about aliens. Amazing, thought Agatha, how because of satellite television, one forgot that the world was really still a large place. I thought it would be tropical, she said. That's because Daniel Defoe set Robinson Crusoe in the Caribbean. Oh, said Agatha, and relapsed into gloomy silence. She brightened only when the launch cruised into Cumberland Bay, and she saw a small township and trees and flowers. She turned to the hiker. Where is my hotel? The Panglass? Over there, that red roof. But how do I get there? It seems miles. Walk, he said and he and his companions laughed heartily. They disembarked at a quayside. The pretty little girl tugged Agatha's sleeve and led her towards a jeep. We get a lift, said Agatha with relief. But the relief was short-lived. The jeep set off up a mountainous, dry riverbed of a road, lurching and bumping, swinging round to hang off the edge of a cliff, and then plunging down a steep gradient and roaring up the other side almost at the perpendicular, I'll kill Sue when I get back, thought Agatha, and then realised with a little shock that from the airfield to this scary journey to the hotel, she had not thought of James once. To Agatha's relief, the hotel was beautiful. 
There was a huge lounge with picture windows looking out over the bay. Her room was very small, but the bed was comfortable. Outside the lounge was a deck with easy chairs. She searched through her luggage and put on a T-shirt with a long-sleeved blouse over it. She went out onto the deck and ordered a glass of wine from an attentive waiter. It was warm in the sun, and the air was like champagne. An odd feeling of well-being began to permeate her body. What a strange place, she thought. She could almost feel the darkness lifting out of her. Her spirits rose even further at dinner, when, as a starter, she was served with one of the biggest lobsters she'd ever seen. She tackled it with gusto, and then looked round at her dinner companions. The pretty girl was there, but not the bearded man. The central table was dominated by a large family speaking in Spanish. They were made up of an obviously married couple, thin and athletic, with three children, beautiful little girls, a middle-aged woman and a young man. To Agatha's right, a husband and wife sat, eating lobster in silence. Some of Agatha's old misery crept back. She did not know any Spanish. She was marooned on Robinson Crusoe Island and condemned to silence for the rest of her stay. The middle-aged woman, who had been casting covert glances at her, suddenly rose and came over to Agatha's table. I hear from the staff you're English, she said. She had a plump, motherly face and little twinkling eyes. I am Mary Hernandez, and I'm here with my daughter and her husband and my son Carlos. The hotel does not hold many guests. Perhaps we should all sit together? Agatha happily agreed. She joined the Hernandez family, as did the pretty girl, but the silent couple in the corner merely shook their heads and stayed where they were. All the Hernandez family from Santiago spoke English, apart from the small children, and they translated for the young girl who said her name was Dolores. They all said, like Agatha, that they had expected a tropical island. Marie said she had a spare sweater in her luggage and would lend it to Agatha. Marie told Agatha that the island was a national park. Her son, Carlos, proceeded to give Agatha a lecture on the history of Alexander Selkirk. He had been a seaman aboard the Sink Ports, a privateer, and he had complained all the way around Cape Horn about the accommodation and the food on board. When the ship reached Juan Fernandez to take on fresh water, he had demanded to be set ashore with a musket, powder, and a Bible. But when he saw the captain was actually going to go ahead with it, Selkirk said he'd changed his mind. But the captain had had enough of the grumbling seamen, and so he was left. Most castaways would have shot themselves or starved, but Selkirk was saved by goats introduced by the Spanish, which he hunted down, using their skins for clothes and their meat for food. He survived for four years, until 1707, when his saviour arrived. Commander Woods Rogers, of the privateers Duke and Duchess, with famed privateer William Dampier, arrived. When Selkirk returned to London, he was a celebrity. Agatha, not used to making friends easily, found at the end of the meal that she felt as if she'd known this family for a long time. Dolores seemed to be picking up words of English with amazing rapidity. When Agatha finally made her way to bed, she glanced curiously at the couple who had not joined them. The woman was blonde, dyed blonde, but very attractive in a baby doll way, and the man dark and Spanish-looking. They were sitting side by side on one of the sofas in the lounge. The woman was whispering to him urgently, and he patted her hand. Agatha felt there was something wrong there. Perhaps the journey had made her tired enough to give her odd fancies. She went to bed and plunged down into the first dreamless sleep she had experienced for a long time. At breakfast the next day, Marie said they planned to walk up to Alexander Selkirk's lookout. She indicated the silent couple. I'll ask them if they would like to go. She approached their table and plunged into rapid Spanish, but it appeared the couple did not want to go. They all went down the cliff steps from the hotel after breakfast, where one of the staff relayed two lots of them in a rubber dinghy over to San Juan Batista, the only settlement on the island. High noon, said Dolores who it transpired had an English vocabulary confined mostly to film titles. She looked down the wide and dusty deserted main street, and they all laughed as she drew and twirled an imaginary pistol. They began to climb. 
first up shallow steps leading up from the township, then onto an earthen track. The stream below them was surrounded by various varieties of wild flowers. Then they entered the silence of a pine forest. Agatha's legs began to ache, but she felt she could not give up while plump Marie soldiered on, and even the little girls showed no signs of flagging. On and up they went, until Agatha stopped and exclaimed at a flash of red, What was that? Hummingbirds, said Carlos. They waited and watched. Green and red hummingbirds whirred about. There was something about the beauty of them that caught at Agatha's throat, and she suddenly sat down on a rock and began to cry. They gathered around her, hugging her and kissing her, while Agatha poured out the whole story of her divorce. When she had finished, Marie said, So you begin a new chapter here on Robinson Crusoe Island, a great place for beginnings, no? Agatha gave her a watery smile. Sorry about that, but I feel miles better. We'll have our packed lunches now, said Marie comfortably, and take a rest. Before you arrived at breakfast, I was wondering about the couple that would not come with us. They are Conchita and Pablo Ramon, also from Santiago. They are on honeymoon. Something odd there, said Agatha, unwrapping a sandwich. They don't look like a honeymoon couple. No, she is very much in love with him, I think, but he looks at her as if he's waiting for something. Perhaps he feels he's made a mistake, volunteered Carlos. They finished their lunch, and though no mention was made of Agatha's outburst, she felt him folded in a warm blanket of friendship and sympathy. To get to the lookout involved a final climb up sheer rock. Agatha and Marie said they would wait below with the children, while the more athletic ones made the ascent. Are you Catholic? asked Marie. No, said Agatha. Not anything, really. I go to the village church, that's Church of England, because the vicar's wife is a friend of mine. And your husband, was he Catholic? Before? No. But I do not understand. How can he become a monk if he was divorced and not even Catholic? He didn't tell them when he first went there. But they surely know now. Maybe because I'm not a Catholic, they do not consider it to have been a real marriage. Let's talk about something else, said Agatha quickly. Marie's attention was taken up then with the children. Agatha looked out at the vast stretch of the Pacific and was hit by a sudden thought. What if James had not really planned to take holy orders? What if he simply wanted to be rid of her and had found the monastery a convenient excuse? They had gone through an amicable divorce. They had talked about safe things, village gossip, James's plans to sell his house. But not once had he discussed his newfound faith. Like the rest of the guests, Agatha had only booked into the Panglass for a week. The following few days took on a dreamlike quality of fresh air and exercise. They went to Robinson Crusoe's cave, they tramped to the hills, returning at night happy and exhausted. There was something about the remoteness and strange beauty of the island that seemed to heal the past and restore courage. In the evenings, Agatha found her eyes drifting over to the honeymoon couple. On the last evening, the new bride was flushed and animated and talking in rapid Spanish. Her husband leaned back in his chair listening, his face expressionless, but with that odd waiting feeling about him. The farewells were affectionate and tearful. Agatha and Dolores were going on a later plane than the family. They exchanged addresses and promised to keep in touch. Sad, said Dolores. Yes, sad, agreed Agatha, but I'll be back. Agatha broke her journey home with a few days in Rio at a luxury hotel, but she found she did not enjoy her visit. The heat was immense and the humidity high. She took a trip up Sugarloaf Mountain and then decided to explore no further. Among the tourist brochures in the hotel was one advertising a tour to see where and how the poor of Rio lived. What kind of people, wondered Agatha, would go on such a tour to gawp at the unfortunate? It was with relief that she finally boarded a British Airways flight for London. She had booked economy. She was at the back of the plane. There was only one screen at the end of the cabin, and so she could not see any of the movies. And during the night, she shivered in the blast of freezing air conditioning. She complained to a female attendant, who shrugged and said, 
okay, and walked on. Nothing happened. People struggled into sweaters, huddled into blankets, and no one but Agatha showed any desire to complain. Bloody British, thought Agatha, finally collaring a male steward. He glared at her and nodded. The plane finally warmed up. In future years, Agatha thought, they will have models of this hell plane in a museum, and people will marvel that humans actually travel in such circumstances, rather in the way that they wonder at the cramped accommodations in old sailing ships. At Gatwick, there was no gate available for the plane, and so they waited an agonizing time before they were herded onto buses on the tarmac. Agatha then began the long walk to collect her luggage. She began to feel that the plane had landed in Devon and they were all walking to Gatwick. By the time she collected her luggage, she was in a blazing temper. But her temper dissipated as soon as she'd located her car and had started to head home. She began to worry about her two cats, Hodge and Boswell. She left them in the care of her cleaner, Doris Simpson, who came in every day to look after them. James was gone. Charles, too. Only her cats remained a permanence in her life. It had been a night flight, and she'd been unable to sleep because of the freezing conditions. By the time she'd turned down the road in the Cotswolds, which led to her home village of Carsley, her eyes were weary with fatigue. Her thatched cottage crouched in lilac lane under a winter sky. Agatha parked and let herself in. Her cats came to meet her, stretching and yawning and rubbing against her legs. She crouched down and patted them, and then caught sight of herself in the long hall mirror that she had put up so that she could check her appearance before going out. She straightened up slowly and stared. She noticed the grey roots in her hair, the dull skin and the lumpy figure, and drew her breath in. How she had let herself go, and all over two useless men who weren't worth bothering about. She phoned her beauticians, butterflies, in Evesham to make an appointment for the following day. Rosemary's having a Pilates class, said the receptionist, so she can't do you in the morning. It'll need to be the afternoon. What on earth is Pilates? It's a system of exercises for posture and breathing, and it exercises every muscle in your body. I'm interested. She has a space in her workshop tomorrow morning. It's an introductory class. Put me down. When is it? Starts at ten and goes on until one. That long? Oh, well, put me down. Agatha rang off. She fed the cats and let them out into the garden, and then carried her luggage up to the bedroom. Too weary to unpack or undress, she fell on the bed and plunged down into sleep. In the morning, as she drove to Evesham, she began to regret booking in for the Pilates class. Agatha was the type who booked an expensive course at a gym, went twice, and then chickened out and so lost her money. Still, she had to do something. Upstairs, said the receptionist, they're about to start. Agatha climbed up the stairs. Four women were struggling into leggings and T-shirts. Agatha, said Rosemary the beautician, welcome back. Home again, said Agatha with a grin. Rosemary was a very reassuring figure with her creamy skin and glossy hair. There was something motherly about her that made women feel unashamed of their lumpy figures and bad skin something reassuring that seemed to say, everything can be made better. The class began. After relaxation, the exercises seemed gentle enough but required fierce concentration. The exercises had to be combined with breathing and strengthening the stomach and pelvic muscles. They finally took a break for coffee and biscuits. Rosemary began to tell the small group that Joseph Pilates had been interned in World War I, and that was when he had developed the system of exercises, and after the war had gone to America, where he had set up classes next to the New York Ballet School. She broke off and took Agatha aside. I know you must be dying for a cigarette. You can nip downstairs and go through to the room at the very back. Agatha longed to be able to say she wouldn't bother, but the craving for nicotine was strong. She stood in the back room, feeling guilty, but nonetheless lighting up a cigarette, Sarah, Rosemary's assistant, was working on someone in the next room. A girl's voice said, I didn't want to do this, but Zach wants me to get a bikini wax before I'm married. This was followed by a giggle. Don't marry him, Agatha wanted to scream. 
she had a feeling of feminist rebellion. It was all very well to keep oneself as fit and beautiful as possible, but all this total removal of hair so that one looked like a Barbie doll, Agatha felt was going too far. And what sort of fellow ordered his girlfriend to have a bikini wax? Thanks, Sarah, she heard the girl say. I'd better go, Zach will be waiting for me. He wants to make sure I've got it done. Agatha heard her leave. She had a sudden urge to see this, Zach. She stubbed out her cigarette and went through to reception. A young man was standing there, hugging a pretty blonde girl. You ready, Kylie? he said. With his dark good looks and the girl's blonde prettiness, Agatha was reminded of the couple on Robinson Crusoe Island. She was snuggling up to him, but he had the same waiting feel about him as the man on the island. She shrugged and went upstairs just as the class was resuming. When it was over, Agatha cheerfully signed on for ten lessons. She felt relaxed and comfortable, and the exercises appealed to her common sense. Time to fight against old age. Strengthen the kneecaps and avoid kneecap replacements. Strengthen the pelvic muscles and avoid the indignity of incontinence. She told Rosemary she would go for lunch and come back to get her face done. She took out her mobile phone and called the hairdresser and booked herself in for a late appointment to get her hair tinted. By the end of the day, when she returned home with her hair once more glossy and brown and her face massaged and treated, she began to feel like her old self, her old pre-James self. The for sale sign had gone from outside his cottage. She wondered what the new neighbour would be like. The next morning, Mrs. Bloxby, the vicar's wife, called. You look great, Mrs. Raisin, she said. The holiday must have done you good. Agatha began to tell her about the family on Robinson Crusoe Island and how much she'd enjoyed their company. As she talked, she realised that she had not once bragged to them about her skill as a detective. Have you heard from James? asked Mrs. Bloxby. James who? asked Agatha curtly. Mrs. Bloxby looked at Agatha curiously. Agatha had, before she had left, refused to talk any more about James. But Agatha suddenly remembered Marie saying that James could not surely take holy orders as he'd been married. The thought that James might just have said that to get off the hook was something she did not even want to contemplate. So, what's been happening? asked Agatha lightly. No crime? No murders for you? said the vicar's wife, very quiet. Who's bought the cottage next door? We don't know. There's a newcomer to our ladies' society, a Mrs. Amstruther Jones. She's just moved into the village. She wanted the cottage, but someone else got it first, so she bought Pear Tree Cottage. You know, the one behind the village stores? What's she like? You can judge for yourself. There's a meeting tonight. Meaning you don't like her. Now, I never said that. If you don't have a good word to say for anyone, you don't say anything. How's Miss Sims? Miss Sims was secretary of the Ladies' Society, an unmarried mother. Miss Sims has a new gentleman friend. He's in sofas. Married, I suppose. I think so. Listen to that. The rain is on again. It's been raining since you left. The doorbell rang. I'm off, said Mrs. Bloxby. Agatha opened the door and found Detective Sergeant Bill Wong on the doorstep. Hello, said Mrs. Bloxby. See you tonight, Mrs. Raisin. I thought you women would be on first name terms by now, said Bill, following Agatha through to the kitchen. It's tradition in the ladies' society that we use second names, and in this over-familiar, touchy-feely world, I rather like it, said Agatha. Coffee? Yes. I see you haven't given up smoking. Did I even say I would try? demanded Agatha, with all the truculence of the heavily addicted. Thought you might. Never mind that. Here's your coffee. How's crime? Nothing dramatic. Nothing but the usual cutbacks. Village police stations are closing down all round. Did you know they closed Carsley Police Station? Never. Yes, on the one at Chipping Camden, on the one in Blockley. So we spend most of our time on the road. Someone called 999 last night and howled it was an emergency. Got there and found it was a cat stuck up a tree. And how's your love life? On hold. Agatha looked at him sympathetically. 
Beale had a Chinese father and an English mother, the combination of which had given him attractive almond-shaped eyes and a round face and a pleasant Gloucestershire accent. How's yours? asked Bill. Non-existent. Agatha saw Bill was about to ask about James, so she began to describe her odd feeling about the couple on Robinson Crusoe Island. It sounds to me as if you were bored and looking for a bit of action, Agatha. On the contrary, I wasn't bored at all. I met some super people. Still, there was something odd there, and I saw a couple in Evesham yesterday who reminded me of them. <laughs> you better find some work quickly or you'll be seeing crime everywhere. Thinking of doing any public relations work? I might. Agatha had once run a highly successful public relations company, but had sold up to take early retirement and move to the country. Since then, she'd often taken on freelance work. Public relations is a different world now, she said. It used to be you were neither fish nor fowl, despised by the journalists and the advertising people as if you weren't doing a real job. Now the public relations people are often celebrities themselves. I hear Charles is married. So what? Oh, well, said Bill hurriedly, I'd better get on. Let me know if you stumble across any dead bodies I could do with a change. After he had left, Agatha switched on her computer to see if she had any email. There was one from Roy Silver, the young man who used to work for her, asking where she was, and one from Dolores, the pretty young Chilean girl. To Agatha's dismay, it was all in Spanish, but she noticed the names Conchita and Pablo Ramon, she printed it off and then drove to the Falconry restaurant in Evesham, where the owner, Juan, was Spanish, and asked him for a translation. She says, said Juan, Dear Agatha, such excitement. Do you remember the couple Pablo and Conchita de Ramon? Well, Pablo has just been arrested. It is in all the newspapers. Conchita was drowned on Robinson Crusoe Island, and Pablo said she fell out of the boat. But a hiker up on the hill saw him push her. He knew she could not swim. He had her heavily insured, and her family are very wealthy. How are you? Let me know, love, Dolores. So that's why he seemed to be waiting, thought Agatha. He was just waiting for the right opportunity. She wished now she'd said something, let him know she was on to him. But she hadn't really noticed anything significant at all. Agatha sat at the ladies' society meeting that night as Miss Sims, the secretary, in her usual unsuitable dress of tiny skirt, bare midriff, pierced navel and stiletto heels, went through the minutes of the last meeting. The teacups clattered, plates of cake were passed round, and outside the rain drummed down on the vicarage garden. Mrs. Anstruther Jones turned out to be one of those well-upholstered, pushy women with a loud, braying voice. Agatha detested her on sight. She could feel some of her old misery creeping back again, and tried the breathing exercises she'd been taught, and to her amazement felt herself beginning to relax. She would phone Roy and see if he had any work for her. James was gone, and Charles was gone, and Agatha Raisin was grimly determined to move on. Chapter 2 Agatha found it hard, as winter moved into spring, to keep up her spirits. It was the rain, steady, remorseless rain. Water dripped from cherry blossom trees in the village gardens, and yellow daffodils drooped under the onslaught. And then, in April, following a day of heavy cloudbursts, a watery sunshine gilded the puddles in lilac lane. Agatha set off for her Pilates class, to which she was now thoroughly addicted, the only healthy addiction she'd ever had in her life. Just before the bridge on the Cheltenham Road in Evesham, she let out an exclamation of disgust. The police were diverting the traffic. She swung right. She was the leading car. Other cars followed her. If I make a left along here, she thought, it'll take me down to Waterside. She cruised down the hill and then jammed on the brakes with an exclamation of dismay. Waterside had gone. The river Avon was rising up the hill before her. She signalled to the other cars that she was going to reverse, made a three-point turn, and decided to head out on the ring road over the Simon de Montfort Bridge and approach Evesham from the top road. Cars were slowing over the bridge to look at the drowned fields on either side. 
She turned into Evesham and parked in the car park at Mersto Green. She decided to walk down to the Workman Bridge and view the extent of the flooding. She walked down Bridge Street, which is a steep hill leading down to the arch of the Workman Bridge. As she approached, she could see that Pont Street on the other side of the bridge was under water. Water surged past the houses on the waterfront. Two people outside Magpie Antiques were desperately hanging onto a doorway and waiting for help. Overhead, an air-sea rescue helicopter whirred across the sky. Agatha marveled that the day had arrived when she could see air-sea rescue turning out to save the people of Middle England. She walked to the centre of the bridge and joined the spectators. Debris and tree branches raced past on the swollen river. There was a crunching sound as a caravan, which had floated loose from a nearby caravan park, got jammed under the bridge. And then, as Agatha leaned over the bridge and stared down at the water, gilded by sunshine for the first time in weeks, she let out a gasp. Like Ophelia, the girl from the beauticians she remembered was called Kylie floated underneath her on the flowing river. Her blonde hair was spread about her. She clutched a wedding bouquet. As Agatha and the other spectators watched in horror, the body twisted and turned and sank from sight. Agatha pointed and tried to scream, but as in a nightmare, no scream came out. But the other spectators were shouting and yelling. A policeman spoke into a two-way radio on his lapel, and then, as they all waited, a police patrol boat came speeding along underneath. More policemen appeared on the bridge, saying, Move along! The bridge isn't safe! Move along! They were hustled back up Bridge Street by the police. Agatha felt shaken. Zack did it, she thought, just like that chap on Robinson Crusoe Island. All thoughts of going to her Pilates class were driven from her mind. You can't just barge in here every time you feel like it, said Mrs. Wong, barring the doorway to her home. I've read about women like you chasing young men. I'm here on a police matter, said Agatha, who had driven to the Wong's home directly from Evesham. Then go to the police station. It's Bill's day off. Bill came round the side of the house at that moment, holding a trowel in one earthy hand. Agatha, he said, I thought I heard someone. Come round to the back garden. What about some tea, mother? His mother muttered something sour under her breath and shuffled off. Agatha followed Bill. The garden was Bill's pride and joy. Just clearing up after that dreadful rain. Bill indicated two garden chairs. Sit down and tell me what brings you. Agatha blurted out about the floods in Evesham and seeing the body of Kylie. She could just have been frightened by the prospect of a wedding and committed suicide, said Bill. It'll come on to Worcester, please, not us. He must have done it. Zack, said Agatha. And remember I told you about that couple on Robinson Crusoe Island? Well, I had an email from someone I met there, and he did murder her. Said she fell off the boat, but he was seen pushing her. I would think it very odd if it turns out to be her fiancé, said Bill. So obvious. But isn't it usually the obvious? asked Agatha. The nearest and dearest? I've got a friend in Worcester, please, said Bill. I'll give him a ring tomorrow. Aren't these floods dreadful? And all those poor people with the contents of their houses wrecked by flood water. Terrible, said Agatha vaguely, her mind still on that image of Kylie floating underneath her. I can't do much to help you until the police find out more, said Bill. Meanwhile, let's go inside and have some tea. I think I'd better get on my way, said Agatha hurriedly. Bill's mother terrified her. If you've got a free moment in the next few days, drop over and let me know what you've found out. If I can't manage, I'll phone you. When Agatha got home, she switched on the news. It was full of pictures of the flooded Midlands, tales of people being swept to their deaths. And then the announcer said, The body of a young woman was recovered from the River Avon at Evesham by divers. She had been spotted by onlookers on the bridge as she floated underneath. She was wearing a wedding gown. Police are not releasing her name until the family has been informed. So far, foul play is not suspected. Pa, said Agatha angrily. What do they know? Hearing her doorbell ring, she went to answer it. Miss Sims stood there, swaying slightly on her usual very high heels. Can I come in? she asked. I've got some news. Of course you can come in, said Agatha. 
leading the way to the kitchen. Is it about that girl in the river in Evesham? What girl? No, it's about your new neighbour. He's John Armitage. And who's he? He writes detective stories. Ever so clever he is. Mrs. Bloxby says his last one, A Cruel Innocence, was on the bestseller lists. Married? Don't think so. Mrs. Anstruther Jones said she once read an article about him in the Sunday Times. She's sure he's a widower. How old? About fifty-something. Miss Sims giggled. Just the sort of age I like. I like mature men. They be ever so generous. Where the young fellows expect you to pay for everything. When's he arriving? Tomorrow. Oh. Agatha felt a flutter of excitement, followed by a feeling of competitiveness. She must get to know him first. Anyway, what's this about a girl in the river? Agatha tell her about the drowned Kylie. Are you going to find out who done it? asked Miss Sims eagerly. I need to say maybe you and that new neighbour could join forces. I don't suppose detective writers know anything about detecting, said Agatha loftily. But when Miss Sims had left, Agatha drifted off on a rosy dream. She and this John Armitage would solve the case together. Murder has brought us very close together, he would murmur. I think we should get married. And James would read about the wedding in the newspapers and feel terrible about what he had lost. She jerked herself out of her reverie to plan. First, she'd better get down to the bookshop in Morton in Marsh and buy a copy of one of his books. In the bookshop, all the talk was of the floods and how the main street at Morton had been flooded. Agatha burst through the little knot of customers and interrupted their never-seen-anything-like-it exclamations to demand harshly, Any books by John Armitage? Just his latest, said the bookseller, a cruel innocence. That'll do, said Agatha, get me a copy. And ignoring the glares of the interrupted customers, she paid for the book and headed back home. Once there, she unplugged the phone and settled down to read. Her heart sank by the time she'd read the first two chapters. The story was set in a tower block in Birmingham, much like the one in which Agatha had been brought up. It started with the ferocious gang rape of a young girl. It was compulsive reading, but Agatha read for escape, not to be reminded of scenes of her youth, the past which she tried so hard to forget about, to bury. She began to picture this John Armitage in her mind, for there was no photo of him on the cover of the book. He would be short, with a beer belly. He would be middle-aged, with a beard and a false, hearty laugh. But she continued to read, because the story was gripping. And by the end of it, she knew she was free from indulging in any romantic thoughts about her new neighbour. Let the other village women call on him with scones and cakes, she, Agatha Raisin, would get on with studying one real-life murder, for Agatha was convinced it was murder. Agatha drove down to Morton in Marsh the next morning to buy the Evesham Journal. There were pages of photographs of the flood, but only a brief report about Kylie's death, still with that quote from the police saying that they could not release the name until close family had been informed. She returned home. A removal there stood outside the neighbouring cottage, but she only gave it one brief, sour glance before letting herself into her own cottage. She phoned Bill Wong at Merchester Police Headquarters, but was told he was out on a job. She then phoned Rosemary at Butterflies and asked for Kylie's address. I can't do that, Agatha, said Rosemary. I wouldn't, for example, give anyone your address. But she's dead and I'm not. Sorry, can't do it. You do understand? No said Agatha crossly, and put down the phone, and then wondered what she was doing, snapping at the best beautician around. There was a ring at the door. When she answered it, Mrs. Bloxby was standing there. Come in, said Agatha, I've got lots to tell you. Over coffee, she described seeing Kylie's body in the river. It's so frustrating, said Agatha finally. I'd like to get started, but I don't know anything about her. It's early days yet said the vicar's wife soothingly. You may have a soulmate next door. Him. I read one of his books. They are very violent, but he does know how to tell a good story. He doesn't seem like my type. You've seen him? Not yet, but you can always tell what they look like from their writing. He's probably short and fat with a beer belly and a beard. 
My, and you got all that from just reading one of his books? I'm quite good at that. Mrs. Bloxby, who had just met John Armitage, opened her mouth to tell Agatha that she was way off the mark, but then closed it again. And Agatha, in love once more with a next-door neighbour, didn't even bear thinking of. Mrs. Bloxby was fond of Agatha and did not want to see her getting hurt again. Well, I gather he's going up to London for a week immediately after he's unloaded his stuff, so he won't be able to see if your description fits for another week. Not interested anyway, said Agatha with a shrug. Assuming the vicar's wife hadn't yet met the author either. After a week, Agatha had quite forgotten about her neighbour and was wondering if she would ever be able to get in touch with Bill Wong again. She dreaded calling at his home and finding herself put down once more by the terrifying Mrs. Wong. But just as she was wondering whether she should stake out Murchester to police headquarters to see if she could waylay him, Bill called round. Agatha practically dragged him into the house, crying, Where have you been? What's been happening? Sit down, relax, said Bill. I got caught up investigating a series of break-ins in Merchester. I only got round to phoning my friend in Worcester CID last night. It's all rather odd. What's odd? asked Agatha, scrabbling in a packet for a cigarette, while not taking her eyes off Bill's face. She died of an overdose of heroin. Her fiancé, Zach Jensen, said she was addicted, but had promised him that she'd given up the habit. Agatha's face fell. So it was suicide? We might think so, except for one thing. What's that? The body had been frozen. What? Yes, after death, the body had been frozen. It was dumped in the river during the floods. Maybe the idea was to give the impression that she was just another flood victim. In her wedding gown? Yes, you would think they would have taken it off first, but then it would have been frozen to the body. The girl's name was Kylie Stokes. She worked for a company on the Four Pools estate. She was something to do with computers. Four days before her body was discovered, the girls in the office gave her a hen party, all getting drunk and dressing her up in tinsel and streamers and parading her through the streets. Her wedding was supposed to have taken place two days after. She'd already taken leave from work. Her mother says she went out late and never came home. She reported her missing to the Evesham police. Every shop and building and home in Evesham that might have a deep freeze is being checked. And what of Zack? Well, as we can't pinpoint the time of death, it's hard to ask him for an alibi for a specific time. Bill, when I saw her at the beauticians, she did not look like a drug addict. She looked the picture of glowing health and happiness. That's the most I can tell you at the moment. What sort of family are the Stokeses? No harm in telling you, it'll be in the papers tomorrow. Mrs. Frieda Stokes is a widow, works a stall at Evesham Market, you know, the covered market in the high street. By all reports, decent and hard-working. Kylie was her only child. This whole thing has hit her hard. She lives in one of those terraced houses near the income tax office, just off Port Street. I haven't the number with me, which is probably just as well. She's very distressed, so I don't want you knocking on her door. And what about Zack? He is employed as a bouncer at his father's disco called Hollywood Nights in Evesham. The police have been called out to the disco several times, usually drunken fights between youths. Neither he nor his father has any criminal record. Zack seems genuinely broken up. If she was in a wedding gown, you'd think if, just if, someone gave her an overdose of heroin, that the murder would have taken place at her mother's house. I mean, the groom isn't supposed to see the bride in her gown until the wedding. Agatha, if it weren't for the fact that the body had been frozen, I would be happy to assure you that Kylie was just another unfortunate on drugs. And wouldn't a frozen body have sunk? No. On the contrary, if the body had still been frozen, it would have floated. It had thawed out to river temperature, which isn't very warm, and the flood currents in the Avon were strong. The police think the body got caught up in some sort of whirlpool just before the bridge and spun up to the surface before sinking again. But don't go around thinking Zack did it. Just because there was a case in Chile doesn't mean the same thing happened here. Kylie's mother isn't well off by any means. She hadn't made a will. There was nothing to be gained by Kylie's death. The disco. Are you sure there's nothing there to connect it to drugs? No, nothing. If there were, what the police would know. I've said this before, Agatha, and I'll say it again. Why don't you leave it all to Worcester Police? They really are very good indeed. 
Hmm. After Bill had left, Agatha decided to drive into Evesham and ask Sarah, who had been working on Kylie, whether she thought the girl had been on drugs. As she got in the car, she saw a squat man with a beard working in the front garden of the house next door. She grinned to herself. He was everything she had imagined the author to be. She parked in Mosto Green in Evesham and went into the beauticians. She was in luck. Sarah had just finished with one customer and was taking a break before the next. I want to ask you about Kylie, said Agatha. Did she look as if she was a heroin addict? Sarah looked shocked. No, she was the picture of health. Not only were there no track marks, but no signs that she'd been sniffing the stuff. Beautiful skin that poor girl had. Is that how she died? Drugs? Was it a bad ecstasy pill? I gather the police are saying she died of a heroin overdose. Oh, dear. There's a lot of drugs in Evesham, I believe. Have you heard anything about that disco, Hollywood Nights? Not a thing, but then I don't live in Evesham. Agatha thanked her and left. She stood outside, irresolute. As if to mock the recent suffering of the inhabitants, the weather had turned balmy and warm. She suddenly missed both James and Charles. They would have been every bit as interested as she was in finding out what had happened to Kylie. Then she thought of Roy Silver, who had once worked for her. She would invite him down for the weekend. Roy descended from the London train at Morton in Marsh, wearing a black sort of Gandhi-style collarless business suit and fake crocodile boots with very pointed toes. He came off the train, talking rapidly into his mobile phone. You're impressing no one, said Agatha. And she went to meet him, and he tucked his phone away. Every nerd in the country has a mobile phone. You haven't changed, said Roy huffily. I do have a stressful job, you know. He still had the white-faced, rather weedy look of an East End of London urchin. He deposited a damp kiss on her cheek, and then followed her to the car where he stowed his luggage in the back. So, tell me all about this murder, he said as Agatha drove off. Agatha told him what she knew, ending with, If it wasn't for the fact that the body had been placed in a deep freeze somewhere, the police might have let it go as death by misadventure. Still could be. How do you make that out? Well, say the fiancé knew about her drug habit. She doesn't need track marks. She could have been sniffing the stuff. She finally takes to the needle, drops dead. This sack is alarmed, doesn't know what to do. Panics, puts the body in a freezer somewhere. The police can't find all the freezers in Evesham. Could be one in a shed in someone's back garden. A lot of these chest freezers are too big to keep in the house. Panic subsides, realises they should have left the body as is. Can't call the police. Floods start, great opportunity, dump it in the river. But in her wedding dress? Well, people in a panic will do anything. Where do we start, Sherlock? I thought we might go to that disco tonight. We'd stick out like a pair of sore thumbs. I can pass, but you're too old, sweetie. Thanks a bunch. So, we need an excuse. I tell you what, I had a friend who was a researcher for the BBC. He said half his time was going places and asking people all sorts of questions. I'll be the researcher, and you can be someone who's writing a script on the life of young people in Middle England. Except for one thing, hasn't your photo been in the local papers in the past? Yes, but I can disguise myself. Try, and I'll see if you'll pass. Agatha called on Mrs. Bloxby, accompanied by Roy, because there was a box of theatrical wigs and costumes at the vicarage used for the various church amateur dramatic shows. Agatha selected a blonde wig and a pair of spectacles with plain glass lenses. Once she tied the wig back with a black ribbon, it looked less false. You'll do, said Roy. I don't suppose you'll come to any harm, said Mrs. Bloxby doubtfully, who'd been told all the latest news about the death of Kylie. Just going for a recce, said Agatha cheerfully. Have you met your new neighbour yet? No, but I've seen him and he's everything I imagined him to be. Without talking to him? I don't need to. I saw the beard and the beer belly. Roy noticed a look of almost unholy glee in Mrs. Bloxby's usually mild eyes. At that moment, the vicar called from the study. 
That Amscover Jones woman is coming up the path. Has the Agatha creature left yet? Excuse me, said Mrs. Bloxby, flushing pink. She hurried off to the study. The vicar doesn't seem to like you, said Roy as the doorbell went. Oh, I don't think he likes anyone, said Agatha huffily. In my opinion, he shouldn't be a vicar at all. The doorbell rang again. Should we answer it, said Roy. Leave it to them, retorted Agatha. The vicar appeared, looking flustered, followed by his wife. My dear Mrs. Raisin, he said, I gather from my wife that you ever heard me referring to some Agatha creature. I am so sorry. We have a mangy stray cat around the churchyard called Agatha, and my wife will feed it. Roy reflected that he had just heard one of the lamest excuses ever, but Agatha seemed mollified. The doorbell went again. I suppose I'd better answer it, said Mrs. Broxby. The vicar hurried back to his study. Mrs. Anstruther Jones bustled in. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, she fluted. And who do we have here, your son? No, said Roy straight-faced. I'm her lover. Let's go, said Agatha, gathering up her disguise. Well, I never, exclaimed Mrs. Anstruther Jones after the door had closed behind Agatha and Roy. Disgraceful, a woman of her age. I hope as a lady of the church, Mrs. Bloxby, you'll tell her what you think of her liaison. Mrs. Raisin is not having an affair with that young man, but he said when confronted with someone who appears to be in a perpetual state of outrage, it is tempting for other people to wind them up. Besides, I've always found the most vociferous guardians of morality on matters of sex are those who aren't getting any. Some tea? Agatha recognised Zack standing at the door of the disco. Whatever distress he might feel over the odd death of his bride-to-be he did not show. He smiled and said, You sure you want to come in here? It's all young folks. We're doing some research for a television programme on provincial entertainment, said Agatha. Well then. Zack beamed and flexed his muscles under his dinner jacket. You've come to the right place. You better have a word with my dad. He owns the place. He turned and shouted, Take over the door, Wayne. A fuggish young man came out, his beady eyes raked over Agatha and Roy. Police again. No, television, said Zack proudly. Come along. The disco had the usual revolving crystal ball with strobe lights shooting at it from different corners of the room. Kylie must have thought she'd won the jackpot getting Zack, thought Agatha. Some of the girls were pretty, but the youths were of the thin, white-faced, round-shouldered type, as if they'd spent their formative years hunched up in front of the television set eating junk food. There was a bar over in the corner to which Zack led them. The music was so loud it beat upon the ears, it reverberated through the floor under their feet, and it assaulted every sense. The air was hot and filled with the smell of sweat and cheap perfume. Zack's father was standing at the bar. Zack mouthed something in his ear, and he looked at Agatha and Roy and then jerked his head. They followed him up a staircase at the corner of the room, and then through a thick, padded door and into an office. Agatha sighed with relief as the dreadful sound of the music became muted to a thud, thud, thud on the downbeat. I'm Terry Jensen, said Zack's father. Sit down. Drink. Agatha asked for a gin and tonic, and Roy ordered the same. Terry went to a glass of wrought iron bar in the corner and began to pour drinks. He was a powerfully built man, his shirt stretched over his back muscles. He had the same thick head of black hair as his son. His legs were very short and rather bandy. He was wearing a white nylon shirt over a string vest, grey trousers and black lace-up shoes, very shiny, like the type of shoes an off-duty policeman wears. He handed them their drinks. His face showed no trace of the good looks with which his son had been blessed. His skin was swarthy, his mouth thick-lipped, and his eyes were large and pale and slightly protuberant. Agatha and Roy were seated on a fake leather sofa facing a large desk behind which Terry sat. Zack sat on a hard chair near the door. Now what's all this about us being on telly? asked Terry. Agatha, clutching a clipboard, made a speech about covering entertainment in the provinces. Television had become too London-oriented. They needed to find out first some details about the club, the hours it was open, what kind of young people attended, 
And have they ever had any trouble with the police? We had no trouble with the police, said Terry. No drugs here and no underage drinking either. He began to brag about his disco, how he had set it up two years before, after he had moved down from Birmingham, when he realised there wasn't much for young people to do in the evenings. Agatha scribbled notes, not caring much what she wrote, as she had no intention of ever using any of it. At last, she said, looking at Zack, I was very sad to read about your loss. Zack's eyes suddenly filled with tears, and he buried his face in his hands. We don't want to talk about it, said Terry gruffly. It's a bad business. Now, if you pair would like to go down to the club, I'm sure you'll want to talk to some of the young folks. Agatha rose, feeling chastened. She'd been so sure Zack would turn out to be a villain. She longed to ask him if Kylie had any enemies, but he seemed too genuinely distressed to cope with any questions. Now all she wanted to do was to get out of the club, but she had to pretend to be working for television for a bit longer. As the noise once more beat upon her ears, she wondered how on earth anyone was supposed to even hear a question. Roy grabbed her and shouted in her ear, You go and stand outside and I'll get some of them out there. Agatha gratefully made her way outside. She lit a cigarette and waited. Even out on the street, she could feel the beat from the disco reverberating under her feet. She glanced round at the surrounding houses. How could the neighbours stand the noise? Roy then came out, followed by ten excited teenagers, their eyes shining with the prospect of being on television. He and Agatha patiently answered questions of the have you met and what was he like variety about pop stars. Roy, because of his high-powered public relations job, knew some of the pop stars they were being questioned about and cheerfully gossiped away. Agatha's head was beginning to itch under the heavy blonde wig. She raised her clipboard and asked them for their names and addresses and occupations. Five were unemployed, but one of the girls said she was in computers. That wouldn't be the firm where Kylie Stokes worked, asked Agatha. Yes, she worked alongside me at Barrington's, said the girl. And you are? Agatha squinted down at her clipboard. Sharon Heath. Sharon was tall and thin. She was wearing a tube top which exposed a bare midriff. A stud winked in her belly button. She had a stud in her nose and four gold rings in each of her ears. Her makeup was a white mask with eyes ringed with coal. Although young, her shoulders were already rounded and everything about her drooped, including her eyes and her thin mouth. Her hair, dyed aubergine, was long and lank. It was ever so sad about Kylie, said Sharon. Shut the desk next to mine. Barrington's, it transpired, was not a computer company, but a firm which supplied bathroom fittings. Sharon worked in what would have been, in the days before computers, the typing pool. Like herself, Kylie had dealt with accounts and orders. I gather it's a suspicious death, said Agatha. Did anyone dislike her enough to kill her? Sharon put her hand up to her mouth and giggled nervously. This Phyllis! Terry Jensen appeared in the doorway. Sharon muttered, Got to go! and hurried off inside as the rest returned to their questioning of Roy about pop stars. We might have got something after all, said Agatha as they drove out of Evesham. I'd like another word with Sharon. I've got her address. I think we should call on her tomorrow. Right, said Roy. You haven't mentioned James. There's nothing to mention. Drop the subject. As Agatha turned the car into Lilac Lane, she saw lights burning in the author's cottage. She saw the broad, tweedy back of Mrs. Amstrother Jones at the window. She appeared to be talking animatedly. My new neighbour's been trapped by the village boar, commented Agatha. She parked the car and she and Roy walked indoors. You don't seem to have formed a favourable opinion of him, said Roy. I didn't meet him, I saw him digging the garden. Sure, that was him? Why'd you ask? It's only when you were describing him there was a look of amusement in Mrs. Bloxby's eyes, as if she were laughing at you. Agatha stared at Roy in surprise. Mrs. Bloxby? You must be joking. Mrs. Bloxby would never laugh at me. Chapter 3 Sharon Heath lived in a modest terrace house off Port Street near the income tax office. The day had turned warm and Agatha's head was once more itching under the blonde wig. 
Wait a minute, said Roy, seizing Agatha's hand as she was just about to ring the bell. We haven't decided what we're going to say. We're supposed to be doing research into youth in the provinces in general, not ask about Kylie in particular. We'll ask the usual boring questions and then just slip it into the conversation, said Agatha impatiently. Roy gave a resigned shrug. Sometimes, he knew from bitter experience, Agatha had all the tact of a charging rhino. Agatha rang the bell. They waited quite a few minutes, and Agatha was raising her hand to ring the bell again when the door was opened by a blousy-looking woman wrapped in a dressing gown. Whatever it is, we don't want any, she made to shut the door. We're from television. Oh, the magic of television. The woman's hand fluttered up to the rollers in her hair. Oh, my, I'm Mrs. Heath. Whatever must you think of me? Give me a moment. The door slammed. What's that all about? demanded Agatha crossly. We're from the telly, so she's gone to pull the rollers out of her hair and cram her nasty floppy carcass into a body stocking, said Roy waspishly. Agatha lit a cigarette. Above, the sky was pale blue, looking as if it had been scrubbed and washed by all the recent rain. The faintest of breezes blew along the street. Church bells clanged out over Evesham. From one of the neighbouring houses, a baby set up a crotchety wail. Finally, the door opened and a transformed Mrs. Heath stood there, hair lacquered, flowery makeup, and figure encased in a tight imitation silk dress of imperial purple. Come in, she cooed. Sharon was just telling us how you've been at the club last night. Will my little girl be on the telly? Possibly, said Agatha briskly. She did strike us as being an interesting subject. She craned her neck round Agatha. Where's the cameraman? That comes later, said Agatha briskly. We have to do the research first. Come in, Mrs. Heath stepped aside. The lounge is on your left. The lounge was a small room that showed all the signs of having been hurriedly tidied. Agatha sat down on an armchair, which crackled because newspapers and magazines had been hurriedly thrust under the seat cushion. Now, said Mrs. Heath, can I get you some refreshment? Her mouth was a thin lipstick line turned down at the corners, and her eyes were hard. Agatha judged that when she was not smarming to visitors, Mrs. Heath could very well have a bad temper. Nothing for us, said Agatha. Where's Sharon? I'll just get her. Mrs. Heath sailed from the room. Soon her voice came back to them, harsh and angry. For Pete's sake, move your arse, girl. You're not going to wait all day. A few moments later she reappeared, followed by Sharon, who was wearing a blouse of glittery material and a long skirt over a pair of platform-soled boots. The sole was so thick they looked like diving boots. She had liberally applied tan makeup, which stopped short at her jawline and contrasted sharply with the unhealthy whiteness of her neck. Now, said Agatha, putting her clipboard on her lap, we're doing a feature on youth entertainment in the Midlands, but we're also interested in crime. There have been incidents of girls leaving discos late at night and never making it home. I saw about them on the telly, but it ain't happened in Evesham, said Sharon, picking nervously at her red nail polish. It was that Kylie, broke in Mrs. Heath eagerly, said the papers this morning, said she died of a heroin overdose and the body was frozen first, did you ever? Sharon's plucked eyebrows rose almost to her hairline. Drugs, Kylie? Nah. I asked you if she'd had any enemies, pursued Agatha. You said something about someone called Phyllis. I don't know. If this goes on the telly, she'll claw my eyes out. I assure you it won't, said Agatha. I'm just trying to understand how such a thing could have happened. Promise she won't say anything. Cross our hearts and hope to die, said Roy solemnly. As if registering his presence for the first time, Sharon gave him a coquettish smile. Although perhaps coquettish was the wrong way to describe it, thought Agatha, given that Sharon's mouth was heavily painted with deep purple lipstick, it had more of a vampire look. Well, said Sharon, eagerly and leaning forward to enjoy a now sanctioned piece of gossip, Zack was dating Phyllis. Phyllis is a big girl, never so noisy when she's had a few. What she didn't know was that Zack was dating Kylie at the same time. One day Kylie turns up in the office with an engagement ring. Phyllis goes ape shit, 
and tries to pull Kylie's hair out, you know, to separate them. She said, you will never marry him, I'll kill you first. There, what do you think of that? Very interesting, said Agatha. Where does this Phyllis live? I can't tell you that, said Sharon, alarmed. She might guess I told you. No reason to, said Agatha smoothly. Is there any way I could interview all the girls she worked with at once? There's McDonald's on the Four Pools. We must have gone there about one o'clock. But the police will surely have interviewed Phyllis. They come round to speak to all of us, but we're all so frightened of Phyllis, nobody said a word. Feeling that she'd got something to go on, Agatha then asked Sharon all about her interests and hobbies, which turned out to be going to the disco and watching soaps on television. When she'd finished, Mrs. Heath saw them out, saying, You will let us know when the cameras are coming, so we can get the place redecorated. Agatha, worried at putting the woman to unnecessary expense, said quickly, We'll be doing any filming or interviews at the disco. John Armitage shifted restlessly in his chair, vowing to lock the cottage door and never leave it open again, for facing him was Mrs. Amstruther Jones, who had simply walked in without knocking. This book is continued on Disc 2. Disc 2 John Armitage shifted restlessly in his chair, vowing to lock the cottage door and never leave it open again, for facing him was Mrs. Anstruther Jones, who had simply walked in without knocking. She broke off a lecture about her importance in the village as the sound of a car went past the windows of the cottage. That'll be your neighbour Agatha Raisin and her toy boy. Really, he said in a bored voice, now, if you will excuse me, not that she doesn't occasionally do good work, like underwater basket weaving for the bewildered. She stared at him, her mouth open. And I really must get on, Dr. Wright. She rose and picked up an enormous, shiny leather handbag. Ah, your muse, she said coyly. Exactly, he said, ushering her to the door. When she was out, he locked the door behind her. He sat down at his computer and switched it on. He stared at the screen. Agatha Raisin. From village gossip, he gathered she was some sort of amateur detective and had been married to the chap who formerly had this cottage. There was one thing in her favour. She hadn't come snooping around like almost every other woman in this village. He could only hope that when the novelty of his presence wore off, they would all leave him alone. Just before noon the following day, he heard the door of his neighbouring cottage slam shut. Suddenly curious to see what this Agatha Raisin looked like, he went to the window on the small landing at the side of his cottage, where he could get a view of his neighbour's front door. A woman was just getting into her car. She had odd-looking blonde hair, it looked like a wig, and ugly glasses. Well, if that can get herself a toy boy, good luck to her, he murmured and went downstairs to start work. Agatha had run Roy to the London train the evening before, and had to admit she missed his support. She had given him money to buy her a more respectable blonde wig with instructions to post it to her. She could only hope that the excitement of television would stop the young women of Barrington's from questioning her too closely. Again, the weather was fine. Sun shone in the car windows, and the resultant heat made her wig feel even more uncomfortable. She went to Tesco's in Evesham to buy groceries, and then arrived at McDonald's at just after one o'clock. Sharon and four other young girls were seated round a table. Clipboard at the ready, Agatha approached them. I think I saw some of you at the disco the other night, she began. I'm working on a television programme on the activities of youth in the Midlands. I wonder if I could ask you a few questions. They eagerly made room for her. She took down their names as an opening gambit. As well as Sharon, the others were Anne Trump, Mary Webster, Joanna Field, and Phyllis Hager. They said only one, Marilyn Josh, was missing. She had a hair appointment. Agatha studied Phyllis. Everything about her was large, although she was not fat. It all looked like solid muscle. She had large brown eyes, a large full-lipped mouth, thick black hair, and a generous bust. 
Her eyes glared this way and that, as if she were in a perpetual temper. Agatha proceeded to ask them the same general question she had asked Sharon, and noticed that Phyllis mostly butted in with all the answers. They resented Phyllis's hogging the limelight, Agatha could see that. When she herself had been working her way up, starting with lowly office jobs, Agatha had been amazed to find that each office seemed to contain one bully. She longed to put Phyllis down, but at the moment she was a suspect, and Agatha didn't want to alienate her. She decided not to ask any questions about Kylie, but to try to arrange a meeting with Phyllis and get the girl on her own. So Agatha wrote and wrote, and then said brightly, You will get tired of all my questions, but this is simply the start. We do an awful lot of research before we actually start filming. They all said eagerly it was no trouble at all. Agatha thanked them and went to her car. She was about to get in when she heard the rapid clack of high heels behind her. She turned round and found herself confronted by Phyllis. You should really talk to me, said Phyllis. I've got more sophistication than what them have. What if I met you after work, suggested Agatha. That would be ever so nice, said Phyllis, in a sort of strangulated voice she seemed to imagine was upper class. Where? There's a pub called Grapes in Evesham High Street, know it? Yes, but no one much goes there. I know, said Agatha. It's a good place for a quiet chat. I'll see you there at, say, six o'clock. Right you are, said Phyllis. There's large eyes and light with a sort of ferocious vanity. John Armitage was heading up the stairs of his cottage when he heard a car drive up to his neighbour's cottage. Once more he looked out at the landing window. Yes, it was that raisin female all right. Then he stared. But Agatha Raisin jerked the blonde wig off her head and threw it on the car seat, and then took off her glasses. Had she been in disguise? Or did she really think perhaps that she looked younger in that dreadful wig? A pair of good legs emerged from the driving seat as she opened the car door. The sun shone down on her glossy brown hair cut in a fashionable style. Curiouser and curiouser, thought John. I might just call on her. Agatha fed her cats. She was sure she had already fed them, but they looked hungry. She had cooked them fresh fish. She herself ate microwaved meals, but she went to a lot of trouble to see her cats had the best. She bent down and stroked their warm, furry heads, feeling a wave of loneliness engulf her. Her cats, Hodge and Boswell, never really seemed to need her except as a source of food. She glanced at the kitchen clock. Time to get ready to meet the dreadful Phyllis. She remembered she'd left her wig in the car along with her glasses and went out to fetch them. Returning, she went upstairs to the bathroom and made up her face and put the wig and glasses back on. She wondered briefly why no one had called around to ask her why she was always going out in disguise. There was a ring at the doorbell. Agatha went down and opened the door. A tall, good-looking man stood there. He had a lightly tanned face, green eyes, and a strong chin, but he was carrying a Bible. No, said Agatha, and slammed the door in his face. Mormons, she thought as she picked up her handbag, they always send the best-looking ones around. John Armitage retreated to his cottage. He found a Bible in a cupboard with James Lacey's name on it, and thought if he took it along next door it would be a good excuse to meet his neighbour. Well, at least he now knew there was one woman in the village who most definitely did not want to have anything to do with him. He went upstairs to pack. He planned to spend a few days in London visiting an old friend. Agatha opened the door to the musty interior of the grapes. It had neither piped music nor one-armed bandits nor pool table, and so was shunned by the youth of Evesham. Phyllis was already there, drinkless. May I get you something? A dry martini, said Phyllis, who normally drank vodka and Red Bull, but thought a dry martini sounded sophisticated. I don't think that's a good idea, said Agatha. They probably don't know how to make one. What about a gin and tonic? That's what I'm having. All right, then, said Phyllis ungraciously. Make it a large one. Agatha came back to the table, carrying two large gin and tonics. 
Perhaps instead of asking you questions, you begin by telling me about your life, said Agatha. I'm surprised a pretty girl like you isn't engaged. I'm hard to please, replied Phyllis. I think someone like me should move to London. I'm wasted down here. Nothing ever happens here. I wouldn't say that, said Agatha. Floods? Murder? Murder? Kylie Stokes. Oh, uh, load of rubbish, that. Take it from me, it was suicide. How come? Can I have another? Phyllis had managed to gulp down her gin and tonic. Agatha went back to the bar and returned with two more drinks. You were saying? Oh, about Kylie. If you ask me, that wedding would never have taken place. Why? I mean, she had the wedding gown and everything. Zap proposed to her on the rebound. From whom? From me. So you have dumped him? We had this row. We were always having rows. We were hot in bed, let me tell you. Phyllis proceeded to give a description of her sexual prowess in anatomical detail. Amazing, thought Agatha. It was all the fault of those women's magazines which led young girls to believe that the only way to keep a man was to indulge in the tricks of the brothel. But then maybe she was being old-fashioned. The very word modesty as applied to women had gone out of fashion a long time ago. She averted her eyes from Phyllis's thick red lips, trying to fight down a feeling of revulsion at what those lips had done, and said, The body was frozen. You don't commit suicide and then freeze yourself. Place had got it wrong, remarked Phyllis. Did you know she was on heroin? Oh, sure. No track marks. She probably sniffed the stuff. And were you very upset when Zack became engaged to Kylie? I suppose you'll hear it from the other girls. I was furious. I was only getting married to her, despite me. But there was some sort of hen party for them, was there not? Did you go to that? No, silly business. Then Kylie disappeared the day afterwards. The Stokes family had the police round at the office, questioning us all. But the police seemed to think she'd had wedding nerves and had done a runner. And what did you think? I told Zack she'd only wanted a ring to show off to the other girls, but she didn't care for him. So you saw Zack. When was this? About a day before she was found. He came round my house that evening. And was he upset? Phyllis gave a coarse laugh. <laughs> Not after I'd seen to him, he wasn't. You mean you had sex? What do you think? Agatha had a memory of Zack weeping at the club. She thought Phyllis was one horrible out-and-out -out liar. What's all this about Kylie? asked Phyllis suspiciously. I thought we were here to talk about me. And so we are, said Agatha evenly. Don't you realise that to have known someone who was mysteriously murdered makes you newsworthy? It was suicide, said Phyllis mulishly. Now let's talk about me. She proceeded to brag. She had always fancied herself on television, she said, because she had a good personality and was a looker. I hate you, thought Agatha, as Phyllis bragged on. I bet you're capable of murder. I bet you're a narcissist and a psychotic one at that. All the while, she pretended to take notes. And you live alone? she asked when Phyllis finally paused for breath. Let me see, Tim A. Jones Terrace, is that right? Where's your family? Over in Worcester. I wish I were a policeman and I could ask her where she was on the days before the murder, thought Agatha. I must phone Bill and see if they know exactly when she was murdered. I must see Kylie's mother. When exactly did she go missing? Did she return after the hen party? But she must have gone home to get the wedding dress. And why would she put it on and leave the house dressed in it? To show someone? To show Zack? If only she'd not adopted this stupid television role, she could revert to herself and ask questions until Zack and his father threw her out. But at least it would be more straightforward. She missed James. Even Charles would have done. She needed someone as backup. Of course, she could always go and see Worcester police, but she was well aware that they considered her an interfering busybody. Phyllis's voice was churning on about how her family didn't appreciate her ambitions, and that was why she'd left home. They had been dragging her down. I'll talk to the others apart from Sharon and Phyllis separately, thought Agatha, and set her clipboard down on the table and said resolutely, I think that's more than enough for now. 
Phyllis looked disappointed, but Agatha said she had other people to interview. She took a note of Phyllis's home phone number and with relief escaped out into the evening air of Evesham. She glanced at her watch. Only 6.30. Agatha felt that Phyllis had been talking for hours. She hurried off. Phyllis had gone to the loo in the pub that might appear at any minute and start talking again. She walked off rapidly along the high street in the direction of Merstow Green, where she had left her car. She was passing a bookshop when she suddenly stopped and stared in the window, which was still lit. The shop sold remainder books, but the bookseller often had a few books by popular authors at knockdown prices. There was a display of one of John Armitage's books, not the one Agatha had read, and one of them was turned round to show the picture of the author on the back. Agatha found herself looking down at the face of the man she had mistaken for a Mormon. The man she'd seen digging the garden must have been a gardener he had hired. Damn Mrs. Bloxby for a devious woman! That's why she'd looked amused when she, Agatha, had described the gardener instead of the author. Well, it all went to show what a rotten influence the church was on people. Agatha forgot her burst of temper as she drove homewards. John Armitage was certainly attractive. She would call on him and apologise, and they would both laugh over her mistake and... and... Wrapped in rosy dreams, Agatha dashed into her cottage, removed the wig and glasses, changed into a clinging red dress and high heels after putting on fresh makeup, and rushed next door. No one. The cottage stood dark and silent, and his car wasn't parked outside. The next day, Agatha received a visit from Detective Inspector John Brudge of the Worcester Police. Come in, said Agatha, delighted. She thought he had called to enlist her help, for had she not solved an Evesham murder before? He was accompanied by a detective sergeant and a detective constable. Mrs. Raisin, said Brudge severely, we're questioning everyone connected with the death of Kylie Stokes. Yes, said Agatha eagerly, I know a bit about... He cut across her. And it has come to our ears that some woman, saying she's arranging a television program, has been asking questions. We've checked with all the television companies, and not one of them knows of this woman. Agatha's heart sank. What's her name? she asked feebly. That is what's so amazing, she didn't give one. Everyone is so gullible when it comes to thinking they're dealing with someone who claims to represent a television company. This woman was described as middle-aged, blonde, and with glasses. Now, we haven't got a search warrant, but we can get one today to find out if you have a blonde wig and glasses in this house. Do you want to tell us the truth, or do I have to get that warrant? Agatha bit her lip. Then she gave a shrug. Yes, that was me. Before I consider charging you with obstructing police business, tell me what you've learned. Too worried to hold anything back, Agatha told them what she'd found out about Zack's distress, about Phyllis's story, about the other girls. Brudge listened to her impassively and then said, Would you mind waiting in the other room? He saw her across the hall and into the kitchen, and then shut the door behind her. What do you think? Brudge asked his detective sergeant, a young man called Norris. Interfering busybody, said Norris. I'd book her, sir, and get her out of her hair. That's what I should do. On the other hand, she's capable of digging up stuff the people concerned wouldn't tell a policeman. But, sir, we're dealing with a murder investigation. She could get killed. Yes, she could, couldn't she? I'll give her a rap on the knuckles, but I won't stop her. He went and jerked open the door, fully expecting to find Agatha listening outside. But he found she was still in the kitchen. She was sitting on the floor, playing with her cats. I must give you a severe warning, Mrs. Raisin, about the penalties of interfering in a police investigation. But as a favour to you for having been of some little, very little, assistance to us in the past, we will not tell those you have interviewed your real identity. That will be all. Oh, one other thing. Anything else you do find out, you are to report to me immediately. Here's my card. It has my office number, home number and mobile phone number. Thank you, said Agatha meekly. After they had left, Agatha turned over what he had said, and then her face cleared. They weren't going to stop her. 
Agatha was admiring a splendid blonde wig which had arrived by special delivery from Roy when the doorbell rang again. She found a woman she did not know standing on the step. Mrs. Raisin, she said, I'm Frida Stokes, Kylie's mother. Come in, said Agatha. Come through to the kitchen. Would you like a cup of tea? I'm very sorry about your sad loss. Frida Stokes was a sturdy woman with round apple cheeks with a high colour. Her grizzled hair was frizzy and her hands rough and red. She had large eyes of an indeterminate colour. She refused the offer of tea and settled her battered handbag firmly on her capacious lap and studied Agatha. I've heard you're a sort of detective. In a way, said Agatha. I'll pay you to find out who killed my daughter. Won't be much. I've a stall at the market. Glass animals. Don't make much. I'll do it for nothing, said Agatha. I won't take charity. I'm fairly well off and you aren't, said Agatha bluntly. I'll do it. Wait till I get some paper. I'll need to ask you questions. Do you feel up to it? I'm up to anything, said Frida grimly, if it'll nail the bastard who killed my daughter. Agatha darted through to her desk and returned with a sheaf of papers. So, tell me when you last saw her. It was two days before she died. She'd been to some sort of hen party with the girls in her office. She was a bit tiddly when she came home. That would be around midnight. I told her to get straight to bed. She said she'd had a good time. She said that girl, Phyllis Hager, who was always picking on her, wasn't there. As she was off work, I thought I'd let her have a long lie in. My husband's dead. It was only me and Kylie. A fat tear slid down her cheek. Agatha handed her a box of tissues and waited until she composed herself. I went to the market early as usual. I came back at dinner time. Agatha knew she meant lunch time. They still had dinner in the middle of the day in Evesham. The house was quiet. Lazy girl, I thought, and went to wake her. Her bed was empty. Hadn't been slept in. I called Zack. I called her work. I called her friends. Then I called the police. They didn't take it seriously. They said brides always got nervous before a wedding and she'd turn up. Then I found her wedding dress was missing. I phoned them again, but again they wouldn't take me seriously. That was until she turned up dead. What about Zack? asked Agatha. Could he possibly have done it? No, he adored her, and he and his father have been marvellous to me. I couldn't have got through the last few days without them. Zack's broken up. And you never had any suspicion that Kylie might be on drugs? My Kylie? Never. She was part of a youth group at the church. They're very down on drugs. So why do you think she took her wedding dress? Like I said, she'd had a bit to drink. I think one of them girls said she wanted to see the dress. Kylie was ever so proud of it. I think she took it round to one of their houses. She might have been attacked on the road home. It's hard to get a cab. She'd change back into her ordinary clothes, surely, said Agatha. And whoever she'd been visiting, if they had nothing to hide, then why wouldn't they come forward? Maybe whoever it was might be frightened of being suspected. What about Phyllis Hager? She wasn't at the office party, like I said. I don't know if you know this, Mrs. Stokes. Frida. Right then, Frida. I don't know if you know that Zack, according to Phyllis, was dating her. Oh, Kylie told me about that. She said Phyllis hated her. Do you think it could have been her? I'd like to think so, said Agatha. I don't like her. But just think of the organisation. Could Phyllis have injected her with heroin and then dumped her body in a freezer chest and then somehow got it into the river? Was Kylie dating anyone before Zack? She was engaged once before to Harry McCoy. Who's he? He's a machine tool operator at Barrington's. Steady chap. I liked him. What's his address? Frida gave it to her and Agatha wrote it down. Agatha leaned forward. I'd better tell you something in confidence. I've already been investigating your daughter's murder. I've been going around masquerading as someone from television, wearing a disguise of blonde wig and glasses. If you hear about such a person, you'll know it's me. Agatha thought about Brudge. Had he really been encouraging her to go ahead? Worcester police are very good, she said cautiously. They'll probably get to the bottom of it eventually. What about drugs? I didn't think there'd be that much in a quiet place like Evesham. 
You work at the market, you must hear things. Evesham is like everywhere else, riddled with the stuff, said Frida bitterly. They found a pub dealing in the stuff and closed it down. Nobody knows where it's coming from now. The people who take drugs must know, said Agatha. Ever hear of anything connected to the club? Not even one ecstasy tablet. It's been raided at least once. A few underage drinkers, that's all. Give me your phone number, said Agatha. I'll let you know anything I find out. Bless you, said Frida, tears now coursing freely down her cheeks. I've been feeling so helpless. Agatha handed her a wad of tissues. When Frida had recovered, Agatha saw her out and then returned to the kitchen and sat down, feeling guilty. After all, she did not deserve Frida's blessing, for pursuing an investigation out of no higher motive than curiosity and a desire to allay the boredom of retirement in a country village. Mrs. Bloxby was the one with pure motives. Or was she? By omission, she deliberately led Agatha to believe the new neighbour wasn't worth bothering about. She had some explaining to do. Some ten minutes later, Mrs. Bloxby found herself facing a truculent Agatha in the vicarage drawing room. I shouldn't try to manipulate your life, said Mrs. Bloxby ruefully, but I did not want to see you fall enamoured of another neighbour and get hurt. Do you know what I did? demanded Agatha wrathfully. He came to my door carrying a Bible, and I thought he was a Mormon and slammed the door in his face. Mrs. Bloxby snorted with laughter. It's not funny, howled Agatha. What was he carrying a Bible for, anyway? He left it with me, said Mrs. Bloxby, when she'd stopped laughing. It was James's Bible. He found it in a closet. I'll get it for you. She went out and then returned, carrying the Bible. Agatha opened it and noticed James's name written in his familiar handwriting inside. A wave of love and loss engulfed her and she clutched the Bible and stared at Mrs. Bloxby with miserable eyes. It'll pass, said Mrs. Bloxby. All things pass. Agatha firmly put the Bible away from her. So, tell me about John Armitage. I know very little, just that he's a successful writer. He seems very pleasant. I gather he was once married and is divorced. I think the Anstruther Jones woman has been bothering him. I told him not to answer the door to her and she would soon get tired of calling on him. Mrs. Bloxby looked at Agatha ruefully. I am afraid I told him not to answer the door to any of the women. They've all been pestering him, taking him cakes and homemade jam or copies of his books for him to autograph. So I can't do any of those things, thought Agatha. Rats. I wish you had told me the truth she said severely. I'm not a child. No, I shouldn't have misled you, but the temptation was irresistible. I won't do it again. Sometimes I wonder about you, said Agatha. Anyway, that dead girl's mother has just called on me. She wants me to investigate her daughter's death. She even offered to pay me. It must have made you feel like a real detective. I am a real detective, snapped Agatha, who had not quite forgiven the vicar's wife for misleading her about John Armitage. Of course. How are you getting on? Agatha outlined her findings. Mrs. Bloxby listened carefully. Then she said, Someone's dealing drugs in Evesham. Could it be possible that Kylie stumbled across the source? Then that would suggest the club. Not necessarily. One of those girls could have said something, let something slip. They must all have had a bit too much to drink at that hen party. Maybe one of them panicked and told her supplier. Far-fetched, said Agatha grumpily, because she had not considered such a possibility herself. Possibly. Would you like some tea? No, thank you. You'll need to forgive me some time. I have forgiven you, lied Agatha, and stumped out. When she got home, she went over her notes, and then logged everything she had in the computer. Whom should she approach that evening? Perhaps she should start with Harry McCoy before going on to one of the other girls. She looked at her watch and remembered she had a Pilates class and rushed to change into tights and a T-shirt before driving fast to Evesham. By the time she returned home, she was feeling relaxed and refreshed. 
Still no sign of John Armitage in residence, she noted. Later that day, she put on the new blonde wig, tying it in a neat ponytail. It looked much more natural than the old one, and the spectacles with the plain glass lenses really did make her look different. She hesitated before leaving. Was the disguise really necessary? Mrs. Stokes had asked her to investigate, so she could surely go as herself. But then Harry McCoy might be friendly with the girls. He might even be the villain. So Agatha set off, feeling very lonely. She missed Roy's chattering company. When she parked in Merstow Green, she took out a street map of Evesham and checked on Harry McCoy's address. He lived not far from the car park in Horrors Street. She decided to walk. The streets away from the high street seemed strangely deserted. No children played outside. Television flickered behind lace-curtained windows. The wind had risen and fallen cherry blossoms swirled in front of Agatha. It had turned unseasonably cold. She located the small red brick terraced house in which he lived. It looked dark and empty. There were two bells, one for upstairs and one for downstairs, but no one answered the summons of either. Agatha retreated. She decided to go back to the car park and then call back at the house from time to time. She'd forgotten her clipboard with the addresses of the other girls and was reluctant to go all the way home to get it. She sat in her car, smoking and listening to the radio, venturing out once more to take the long walk back to Harry's house. She wished she'd decided to park outside, but there was not a single parking space left in the street, and to double park would draw unwelcome attention to herself. By ten o'clock, she got wearily out of her car again, just one more time. To her relief, there was a light shining in the upstairs window. She pressed the bell and waited. No reply. She pressed it again and stepped back and looked up. No curtain twitched, no face looked down at her. Should she try the neighbours? No, scrub that. She didn't want him to know she was looking for him, or to start lying to neighbours about some fictitious television programme. Agatha wearily turned away. A wasted evening. Why not just forget the whole thing and leave it to the police? She began to walk slowly along the deserted street. And then she sensed danger. Afterwards, she could not say why or what had alerted her or where the sudden feeling of menace had come from. She heard a car approaching. She twisted her head, saw headlights blazing, and in one split second realised the car was rushing at her at full speed. She threw herself over the garden hedge next to her, hearing the car roar past as it mounted the pavement where she'd been standing, and then hearing it lurch back onto the road. She lay in someone's front garden, shivering and panting. A door opened. The next thing she knew was that someone was standing over her. She straightened up, ridiculously relieved to find that her wig was still in place. What the hell do you think you're doing? demanded a small, thin woman angrily. Agatha struggled up. I'm sorry, I must have had a fainting fit and fallen over your hedge. She swayed and then regained her balance. Despite her shock and fright, she did not want to say she'd been nearly killed. Questions would be asked, the police called, and this time Brudge would really tell her to leave the whole thing alone. I know your sort, said the woman wrathfully. Drunk us what you are, and at your age you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Agatha made for the garden gate. One of her high-heeled shoes got caught in a loose brick on the path, and she stumbled and nearly fell. Get out of here, shouted the woman, and sober up. Agatha felt that the walk to her car was the longest she'd ever taken. She did not even feel safe when she was in her car. She accelerated out of the car park at speed. John Armitage had cut short his stay in London, and was making his way leisurely down the road into Parsley, when a car he recognised as his neighbours shot past him and hurtled off in front of him. A crazy driver, he muttered. He proceeded at a reasonable rate, and then parked in front of his cottage. Before he switched off his headlights, he saw his neighbour's car, and that she was still in it, hunched over the wheel. He was about to open the gate and go in, when he hesitated. Maybe she was ill. John approached Agatha's car cautiously, and then looked in the window. She had her face in her hands, and her shoulders were heaving. He rapped on the glass. 
Agatha straightened up and gave him a look of wild terror. He opened the car door. I'm John Armitage, your neighbour. We haven't really met. Is there anything I can do? Agatha took a tissue out of a box on the seat beside her and blew her nose. I had a fright, she blurted out. They tried to kill me. Was it road rage? I'll call the police for you. Agatha shook her head. She'd been crying because, unnerved as she was, she'd been feeling terribly alone. No Charles or James or even Roy to comfort her. Would you like a brandy or something? Agatha gave a choked sob. Then she said, Help me indoors and I'll tell you about it. Chapter 4 once indoors, Agatha settled John in the living room with a drink and went upstairs. She removed the wig and glasses and put on fresh makeup, reflecting that the best treatment for shock must surely be the company of a good-looking man. John looked up as she entered. She certainly had made a remarkable recovery, he thought. Agatha poured herself a shot of brandy and sat down opposite him. Thank you for your help, she said. I don't want the police to know about this. You see... Someone's just tried to kill me. He did not exclaim or protest that she should indeed tell the police, but merely looked at her questioningly. She began to tell him all about the death of Kylie and about how she was masquerading as a television producer. John Armitage smiled. What's so funny? demanded Agatha. It explains the blonde wig. You should really take it off before you return to Carsley. Your disguise has caused a lot of speculation. Mrs. Anne's brother Jones thinks she has the answer. What's that? That you have a toy boy and are striving to look younger. Agatha's face flamed with anger. Silly old bat. Go on, you were telling me about this mystery. So Agatha proceeded to tell him the rest of it, ending up by saying that she did not want to report the attempt on her life because the police would be furious with her. So what are you going to do now? Go on. If I got attacked just because I was trying to see Harry McCoy, then he might be the clue I need. He looked at her thoughtfully, and then he said, You've done this sort of thing before? Yes, said Agatha. She was about to brag about other cases, but her knees began to shake. She was still not over his shock. Had she shown off in her usual way, then John Armitage would have lost interest in her. But the very fact that she was not flirting or simpering or trying to impress him, endeared her to him. You show a great deal of courage, he said. Were you always on your own when things like this happened before? I usually have someone helping me, my ex-husband James or a friend, Charles. But I'm on my own in this one. I must admit I had a bad fright. I might leave it for a few days. He looked at the clock. Goodness, it's one in the morning. I'd better let you get some sleep. And that's that, thought Agatha. She racked her brains trying to think of a way to keep it or suggest another meeting, but she was too shaky and tired. He rose to his feet. I tell you what, why don't you leave everything to Saturday, and I'll come with you, and we'll talk to this McCoy fellow on Saturday morning when he's off work. Thank you, said Agatha. What time? I'll pick you up at nine in the morning. Then Agatha's face fell. Your face is on the jacket of one of your books in Evesham. You'll be recognised. I didn't know what you looked like until I saw your photo. You see, when you arrived on my doorstep carrying that Bible, I thought you were a Mormon. He laughed. What have you got against the Mormons? Nothing at all. I'm sure they're splendid people. I just don't like being preached at on my own doorstep. I have no intention of going in disguise, he said. You can say you've drafted in a celebrity author to help you with the script. I have done television scripts before. And I'll see you Saturday. After he had gone, Agatha went upstairs, undressed, washed, put on a voluminous nightgown, and crawled under the duvet. The events of the evening now seemed like a dream. He was a handsome man. How old was he? Despite his looks, probably around fifty. But men who kept their looks and figures after the age of forty were usually gay. Still, she found the thought of his support comforting, and, she told herself firmly, she had no intention of starting to think romantically about him. She fell asleep and woke two hours later, suddenly sweating with fear. The old cottage creaked and the wind sighed around outside. 
Agatha switched on the bedside light, and then got out and switched on the overhead light as well. Her cats, who usually stepped downstairs in their basket, appeared in the bedroom at that moment and climbed onto the bed. She settled down with a cat on either side of her, and their purring soon soothed her back to sleep. How old do you think John Armitage is? Agatha asked Mrs. Bloxby when the vicar's wife called on her the next day. Older than he looks. Miss Sims said she read an article about him. He's actually 53. I think he's gay, said Agatha. Despite the fact that he's been married? Why? Heterosexual men let themselves go. Not necessarily. Look at my husband. Alf's in good shape. Agatha thought of the vicar. Grey-haired, glasses, scholarly, slightly stooped, and reflected that love was indeed blind. But to get back to the attempt on your life, said Mrs. Bloxby, that really worries me. Couldn't you even tell Bill Wong about it? Bill Wong is a dear friend, but he's a policeman first and last. He would feel obliged to put in a report. Anything to do with drugs is highly dangerous, cautioned Mrs. Bloxby. I can't understand it said Agatha, half-joking. I thought all the drug barons had gone over to smuggling cigarettes. They keep jacking up the price, so it's getting a bit like the state during Prohibition. Do you know there was an item on the news that said that 25% of the British population bought their cigarettes on the black market? No one's ever approached me. I think you're in enough trouble as it is without buying contraband cigarettes, said Mrs. Bloxby severely. Anyway, I thought you were giving them up. I will, I will. Agatha lit a cigarette. When this case is over, if you're still alive, why don't you believe Phyllis's story that she and Zack had sex? Because she's a nasty bitch and a compulsive liar. Still, let's think about Zack. It appears Kylie was a decent girl, and her mother is a sterling woman. What sort of man orders his fiancée to get a bikini wax before the wedding? I mean, a lot of women who are going on their honeymoon get it done as a matter of course, not because of sex, but because of those thong swimsuits, or even the ones that are high cut on the leg. How do you know all this? I'm not totally cut off from the world. But Zack was genuinely upset about her death. Those weren't fake tears. Keep an open mind, and do be careful, dear Mrs. Raisin. I'll have John to look after me. May I give you some advice? I hate it when people say that. Okay, go on. I think it's important you have some sort of protection during your inquiries, said Mrs. Bloxby, but men do not like needy women. Believe me, they can smell needy across two continents. Please do not think of him in terms of romance. I think he could be easily driven away. I don't fancy him, said Agatha sulkily. You seem to think I'm like some sort of teenager. That was what the vicar's wife did think, but she refrained from saying so. Half an hour after Mrs. Bloxby had left, the doorbell went again. Agatha gave a nervous shiver, but reassured herself that the sun was shining brightly outside, and the villain, or villains, whoever they were, surely did not know her real identity. Unless they followed you home came the heart-stopping thought. She peered through the spy hole she had installed in the door. At first she did not recognize the man standing outside, and then, with surprise, she did. She opened the door. Charles? It was indeed Sir Charles Fraith, her old friend and sometime lover. But instead of being small and neat and slim, he was decidedly chubby. His hair had thinned and he had a double chin. Come in, said Agatha. I have a pot of coffee in the kitchen. Although I shouldn't even be speaking to you, why didn't you invite me to your wedding? I could have flown over to Paris. Charles sat down at the kitchen table. I couldn't. You see, I told my wife, Anne-Marie, that we'd once been our uh, intimate. It came up, sort of, when I was telling her about some of the murder cases we'd been involved in. She ordered me not to invite you. So what does she think about you being here today? She doesn't know. I don't like to upset her. She's expecting twins. Agatha put a mug of coffee down in front of him. So what did you come for? She demanded harshly. Curious to see how you were getting along? Splendidly, thank you. Any news of James? 
No. Any murders? What about this business in Evesham? Nothing to do with me, lied Agatha. Look, Charles, I wish you would just finish your coffee and go. I'm sore because you didn't invite me to the wedding. Even though you had blood to your bride about me, you could have insisted, or at least have had the guts to phone me up and tell me about it. I told you I let slip about us to Anne-Marie and so she wouldn't let me invite you. I didn't want to rock the boat. I don't want to have a failed marriage like yours, Aggie. Marriage takes work, he said pompously. Agatha leaned across the table and slid his coffee mug away from him. Get out, Charles. I've forgotten how insensitive you can be. What about a kiss for old time's sake? Out! No need to get sore. I'm going. He walked off stiffly, giving Agatha a good view of his now large bottom. Agatha ran to the door and shouted just as Charles was getting into his car, And don't come back! Agatha then saw John Armitage, who was entering his front door with a bag of groceries, staring at her, and gave him a weak smile before retreating indoors. I hate it when people change, grumbled Agatha to her cats. Charles had really only changed in appearance, but to admit that to herself would have made Agatha feel worse. On Saturday, Agatha's alarm failed to work, and she awoke to find it was a quarter to nine. So instead of the long session she had planned with makeup and clothes, she washed quickly and dressed in the first clothes that came to hand, and put on a little foundation cream and lipstick before scrambling down the stairs just as the doorbell rang. Ready? asked Charles. He was wearing a blue shirt under a soft suede jacket and casual trousers. Ready, said Agatha breathlessly. No disguise. Rats, won't be a minute. Agatha ran back up the stairs and put on the blonde wig and glasses. I meant to advise you to put on your disguise in the car, said John when she reappeared. No, leave it now, he added as Agatha reached up a hand to pull the wig off again. We'll take my car. He drove out of the village smoothly and competently, while Agatha tried to think of things to say but felt unusually shy. At last she said, I hope he's at home. We'll try anyway. How are you feeling? I'm all right now. Things are never so scary in daylight. I've never done anything like this before, said John. In fact, I've never lived in a village before, always been in cities. Like Birmingham. I read one of your books and it was based in Birmingham. I only did research there. No, I lived in London until my divorce. And when was that? Two years ago. An amicable divorce? Had to be done without fuss on her part. She'd been unfaithful to me too many times. Did that hurt? asked Agatha curiously. Not now. I'm glad it's all over. What about you? He left me for the church. Last heard he's in some monastery in France. That must have been difficult. Agatha sighed. I never really had him. It was an odd marriage. We were like two bachelors rather than a married couple. That wasn't the man I heard you shouting at a few days ago. No, that was someone else. I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Why do you set your stories in inner cities? asked Agatha. You don't look like an inner city person. He had a pleasant, cultured voice, no trace of accent. I wanted to write about real people. Sordid surroundings don't make people real? said Agatha with sudden passion, as she remembered her own impoverished upbringing. Their minds are often twisted with drink or drugs, and their bodies old before their time with cheap junk food. You sound as if you were speaking from personal experience. Agatha was a snob, and Agatha was not going to admit she had been brought up in a Birmingham slum. I'm a good observer, she said quickly. I thought I was too. We must talk some more about this. When they got to Evesham, Agatha instructed him to park in Merstow Green. They left the car and were soon walking along the road that Agatha had so recently fled along in terror. People were walking along, women pushing babies in prams, men talking in groups. It all looked so harmless. They arrived at the house. Which bell, he asked. There aren't any names. The light was on in the upstairs before I was attacked. We'll try that. He rang the bell. He waited a few minutes. Then John said, May as well try the bottom one, and rang it. The door was opened by a young man, a very clean young man. He had neat, light brown hair, a round face, a gleaming white short-sleeved shirt, and jeans with creases like knife edges. 
Mr. McCoy? asked Agatha. Yes, but if you're selling anything, no, we represent a television company. We can't cover the young people of Evesham without mentioning Kylie's death. We would, of course, like to know what sort of amusements young people enjoy in a town like this. May we come in? I've um, got someone with me at the moment, he said. Can we go somewhere? There's a cafe along towards the river. That'll do fine. I'll get my jacket. He closed the door. Seems a nice enough fellow, said John. Shh, said Agatha. Why can't I come too? demanded a shrill female voice. Harry McCoy mumbled something in return, and then the door opened. His face was red with embarrassment. They walked along the road together until they came to a cafe, the kind that sold light snacks. They took a table at the window. Outside the river Avon slid along on its green-black way. A launch cruised past, sending waves of water to either bank. I'm surprised this place is still open, said Agatha. I thought it would have been flooded out. It came right up to the doors, said Harry. Mrs. Joyce, that's her behind the counter, who owns the place, had piles of sandbags at the front. Also, the cafe's higher up on a sort of mound than the houses on either side. They got the worst of it. John returned from the counter where he had gone to fetch cups of coffee. Agatha started by asking him questions about how young people amused themselves. Harry said sometimes they went up to Birmingham, a few of them sharing a car and taking turns at staying sober. And what about Hollywood Nights, the disco? I wouldn't be seen dead there, said Harry. What a layabouts. You were engaged to Kylie? Yes. What went wrong with the engagement? Zach's what went wrong, said Harry moodily. Have you seen that car of his? Agatha shook her head. It's a jag. It turned her head. He took to waiting outside Barrington's for her when she finished work and offering her a lift home. Phyllis Ager, she was engaged to Zach at the time, had told him Kylie was a virgin, and he said something like he would soon see to that. I tried to warn her. I couldn't believe it when she broke off her engagement to me and became engaged to him. I thought Phyllis would be here any moment, said Agatha. Why? That was her with you this morning. I recognised her voice. I told her we were going to Butler's in the high street, said Harry, and flushed under Agatha's curious gaze. And are you and Phyllis an item? He flushed again. Nah, Phyllis is, well, she's just a girl, not the kind you get serious about. So was Kylie really in love with Zack? I don't think so. I don't think she could see me on the wedding. Zack's father insisted on paying for a grand wedding, and they were going to spend their honeymoon in the Maldives. Kylie had never been abroad before, never been on an aeroplane, never even been up to London. She couldn't talk about anything else. It is sensitive of her to talk about it to you. She talked to the other girls in the office and they told me. Who lives upstairs from you? asked John, speaking for the first time. Marilyn Josh. Agatha consulted her notes. She works at Barrington's? That's right. Was it Marilyn who had seen her the other night? and alerted whoever it was who had tried to run her down, wondered Agatha. We might have a word with her afterwards, said John. Is she away? She didn't answer the doorbell. She sleeps late on Saturdays and nothing usually wakes her. So, pursued Agatha, what kind of girl was Kylie? She was lovely to look at. I mean, you see girls like that on the telly, said Harry, but you never expect to see one like that here. I couldn't believe my luck when she agreed to be my fiancée. Mind you, I was a bit worried I'd got her on the rebound. John and Agatha exchanged glances. Who was she rebounding from? asked John. Mr. Barrington. What? The owner of Barrington's? Him, yes. Wait a bit, he can't be a young man, surely, to own a firm like that. Harry scowled. He's a dirty old man, nearly fifty. I'm not married? asked Agatha. Yes, he is, but he told Kylie he would get a divorce. Agatha looked at Harry in amazement. And what did the other girls think about Kylie dating the boss? They didn't know. She never told them. I knew because I was mad about her. He flushed an even deeper red than before. I used to follow her. She told the other girls she was taking French classes at Evesham College. So after work, she'd walk to the car park at Evesham College and he'd pick her up there. And were they having an affair? Kylie swore to me they'd never had an affair. 
I used to drive her out to restaurants in the country for dinner. He'd give her presents. Like what? asked John. He gave her a solid gold necklace, that I know. She showed it to me and said she told her mum it was guilt. So how did that end? asked Agatha, who was rapidly revising her opinion of Kylie. A friend of his wife saw them together in that Greek restaurant in Chipping Camden and told her. Turns out his wife has a lot of money and he'd never intended getting a divorce. He managed to persuade his wife that Kylie had been thinking of leaving work and that because she was such a good worker he'd taken her out for dinner to persuade her to stay. Anyway, Kylie started going out with me. <laughs> I thought all my Christmases had come. She was a beautiful girl. But what was she like? demanded Agatha. Of course, you never met her. She had a sweet face and this long blonde hair and a figure like a model and... Agatha did not want to say she'd once seen Kylie at the beautician's, because that might give Harry a hint that she was a local. I'm not interested in what she looked like, said Agatha. I'm interested in her character. Harry blinked a little, a puzzled frown between his brows. John thought that Harry had never really bothered much about what Kylie was really like. She chattered away about the office and the girls and things like that. Girl talk, you know. She said she was ambitious. She didn't want to be stuck in Evesham for the rest of her life. Agatha sighed. But that's exactly what would have happened if she'd married you. Was she a virgin? Harry turned red. That's a very personal question. No harm in answering it now she's dead. No, she wasn't, he mumbled. She was pretty hot. Agatha said, I think we should have a word with Marilyn, seeing as how she lives above you. Do you think she'll be awake now? I phone her. He took a mobile phone out of his pocket and proceeded to dial. He turned a little away from them and muttered into it. But Agatha caught the gist of his remarks, which amounted to that he was with the television people and he didn't want Phyllis to know because she would muscle in on the interview. Agatha's previous mental picture of Kylie, reinforced by the visit from her decent mother, was beginning to change. Instead of Kylie being a fresh-faced innocent, if Harry McCoy's remarks were anything to go by, Kylie had been an empty-headed little tart. Still, the girl had been murdered, and no one should be allowed to get away with that. Marilyn arrived, breathless and excited, wearing black leggings, high-heeled white slingback shoes, a skimpy T-shirt, and a fake fur purple jacket. Her thin shoulders were hunched, and her small mouth hung perpetually open under a long nose and heavy-lidded eyes. Is there a hidden camera? she asked, looking excitedly around. It's not candid camera, said Agatha. We're just asking a few questions about the youth of Evesham in general, and Kylie Stokes in particular. What's your names? asked Marilyn. John Armitage, said John with a smile, and this is Pippa Davenport. He could have thought of a better name for me, thought Agatha. John took over the questioning. He started by asking her about her life. Marilyn flirted with him, giggling and punctuating her answers with hundreds of, you knows. Then he said, have any of you ever been in trouble over drugs? Don't oh, think so. Marilyn looked sideways under her heavy lids at Harry. There's Phyllis. She's tough, you know. She could be taking something, know what I mean? But no one you know has been in trouble with the police? Marilyn shook her head. How long had you all known each other? About a year, you know. Phyllis has been with Barrington's the longest, maybe three years. Me a year. The others have just joined before me. New business, you know. Been building up stuff ever since, you know. There was a small firm in Worcester before then, you know. Just plumbing-like. Then Mr. Barrington decided to expand into bathroom fittings. How old was Kylie? Eighteen, same as me. She'd been working at the market with her mum when she left school at sixteen. She'd taken a computer course at the college, said she wanted to better herself. Quite the little madam, added Marilyn with sudden venom. You don't seem to have liked her, said Agatha. The thin shoulders under the purple jacket shrugged. And yet you all gave her a hen party. Oh, offices, you know. You get along, have a bit of a laugh. So tell me about the hen party. Mr. Barrington let us use the office after hours. We had drinks and a few laughs, and then we dressed up Kylie in streamers and put on funny hats and walked her a bit of a way home, through the town, you know. We was all a bit drunk, 
laughing, you know, and shouting rude remarks at the boys in the streets. And we all split up when we got to the high street. And were there any quarrels? No, Phyllis wasn't there. Troublemaker, is she? Yes, but don't you go telling her I said so. She's got a terrible temper. They asked her a few more questions and then parried her questions about when the programme was going to appear before taking their leave. There are a lot of nice people in Evesham, said Agatha, as she and John walked to the car park. But not that lot of Barringtons, commented John. Which of the girls have you still got to question separately? Three of them, groaned Agatha. Aunt Trump, Mary Webster and Joanna Field. Got their addresses? Yes. So let's try them. You seem to be enjoying this. Oh, it keeps me away from the computer, and it's much more interesting than fiction. When they got to the car, Agatha studied her notes. Aunt Trump lives out on the Cheltenham Road. We could try her. What other stones are we going to lift up? He asked, letting in the clutch. We've got to see Barrington himself. Better see him at the office. Even if we find out where he lives, he won't talk easily with his wife there. Agatha cast a covert glance at John as he negotiated the traffic. Here she was with a very good-looking man, and instead of feeling thrilled, feeling puzzled. He was easy in her company, rather, she judged, in the way he would be relaxed with an author he met at a book convention. That was it. His behaviour towards her was like that of a business colleague. His attitude was definitely sexless, not a frisson. Still, Mrs. Bloxby had advised her not to scare him off, to play it cool. But what did the vicar's wife know about men? thought Agatha sulkily. They had expected to find another flat, but Anne Trump's home was a prosperous-looking villa. Must live with her parents, commented John as they walked up the garden path. I never asked you, how are you feeling now after your fright? I'm all right now, thanks, said Agatha. She was about to add that she felt all right during the day, but was still sleeping with the light on and waking up in a sweat at the slightest sound during the night, but he was already ringing the doorbell. A man in golfing clothes answered the door. Agatha went into her usual television speech and desired to interview Anne Trump. He said he was Mr. Trump, Anne's father, and turned away and shouted, Anne, that telly woman you were talking about is here. I'll leave you in the lounge, he said. My lady wife is out shopping and I'm off to play golf. Make yourselves comfortable. Agatha and John sat side by side on a green velvet covered sofa. Looking round, Agatha decided that much of the family life must go on in the kitchen because everything in the lounge looked new and barely used. The room was cold. A few moments after her father had left, Anne came into the room. She was fairly pretty, with a round face, wide brown eyes and dark curls. Like a drink? asked Anne, going to a cocktail cabinet against the wall and opening it. The strains of Believe Me If All Those Endearing Young Charms filled the room. Inside, the cabinet was lit with pink neon. Agatha noticed that the bottles were all full and glasses of different sizes neatly ranged. Obviously not a family of drinkers. Agatha glanced at John, who shook his head. The thought flashed into her mind that if John did not drink much, there was little hope of softening him up for the kill. Not for us, she said. Come and sit down, Anne. I decided it would be better to interview each one of you individually. She went on to ask Anne about her job and her hobbies and the entertainment of Evesham before getting on to the subject of Kylie's death. I can't think how anyone could murder her, said Anne. I mean, there was nothing to murder. What do you mean? asked John. Well, she was pretty friendly towards everyone, easy to get on with. Apart from that, did she have any boyfriends? asked Agatha. She was engaged to a boy called Harry McCoy, but she dumped him for Zack. Anyone else? What about any of the bosses? She laughed. <gasps> Mr. Barrington? No, not possible. So Harry hadn't gossiped to the girls. So tell me about her engagement to Zack. Was she happy? Agatha looked in irritation at John, who had risen and crossed to the cocktail cabinet and was opening and shutting the lid, letting out bursts of tinkling music. Help yourself, said Anne. John regained his seat. I was fascinated by the mechanism. 
You were asking about her engagement, said Anne. She was ever so happy. She had a lovely diamond ring. Phyllis was mad at her, of course. Anne blushed. Don't tell Phyllis I said anything. She's got a temper. Yes, I gather Phyllis was dating Zach before he got engaged to Kylie. Ever so cut up about it, Phyllis was, said Anne. And Kylie did rather flash that ring under Phyllis's nose. And yet you say there was nothing about her that would drive anyone to murder her. Oh, well, girls are always quarrelling, said Anne sententiously. So you don't think Phyllis could have murdered her? Anne giggled. Are you doing crime watch for the TV? Sounds like it. No, no, said Agatha quickly. Kylie's death intrigues me. And John Armitage here is a detective story writer, a famous one. Anne surveyed John without much interest. Didn't think anyone read books these days, with so many channels on the telly to watch. John sells millions of books, said Agatha. Must be to old people, said Anne. Awful lot of them around these days. To be on the safe side, Agatha turned her questioning back to the pleasures of the youth of Evesham, and then they took their leave. Not much there, said John, stifling a yawn. He's getting bored, thought Agatha. Not surprising. Men of his age who look like him usually go after younger women. I'm getting old, so no one will want me. As she got into his car, she said in a small voice, Maybe you've had enough. Not yet. Who's left? Mary Webster and Joanna Field. OK, let's get rid of one of them and have lunch. Agatha consulted her notes. Mary Webster lives in that new housing development on the Four Pools estate. Make a left here. But when they got to the address Mary Webster had given them, it was to find no one was at home. That leaves Joanna Field, said Agatha. Thank you to all of our viewers for listening to Tap Book's introduction to the book, The Day the Floods Came. We hope you have learned more about this great book. Don't forget to follow Tap Book for more introductions to great and meaningful books. See you next time.